thank you very much to the BITC for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, we've called it Raising the Bar Through Culture Change, and uh, I think, to be honest, we're all still learning on this, and uh, I would never uh, profess to actually have found the solution. But um, hopefully I want to give you an insight into what we're doing, really to drive the, the well-being agenda uh, in the context of our program, our strategy for health, safety and environment improvement, which is actually about raising the bar of our performance through a culture change. So it's really that synergy of well-being with health, safety and environment, which I, uh, I really come from an engineering background. And I'm a great believer that there's a huge benefit in having engaged workforce being a much more safer workforce as well, notwithstanding economic benefits. So uh, what I propose to do is just to give you a bit of an insight into, into Centrica, um, then really talk about how we've been setting the ambition really across that HSND uh, forum. But the criticality of well-being I then try to, try to bring out. Um, and I'll return then briefly to the nature of Centrica because the diversity of it, scale of it, I think is important for uh, really making the business case. And then the vision of the change, really ha what we're doing to try and establish that. And I'm going to show you one tool that we're using, really to try and get the engagement of our, our staff. And then finally, measuring and reporting success, which of course is a very hot topic with the, the publication of the guidelines today. So what is Centrica about? I haven't got lots of, uh, lots of numbers here, but um, basically this, this slide shows eight pictures which really try to capture the diversity of what Centrica is about. Sourcing it, this is it being energy, an integrated energy company, so we source gas and oil, primarily gas, uh, from around the world. We generate it, so using uh, gas-fired power stations, but also wind power, generating electricity for selling to, to customers. Processing gas to make it safe for customers, to get, it goes into the network for uh, customers to use. We store it, we operate the rough gas field in uh, the North Sea, which is the largest gas storage facility in the UK. We trade it, again across North America, the UK, Europe, trading gas, electricity, making <coughs> deals to make sure we can get the best prices possible for, for customers. And supply it, of course, as well, and many of you, or some of you, hopefully, might be uh, British gas customers, supplying gas, electricity to customers. Uh, across the UK and North America um, and service it as well. So going into customers' homes and hopefully you can start to see the diversity now. Engineers going into customers' homes, working on boilers, white goods uh, to actually help them help, help our uh, customers. And finally, in a growing area, save it by actually putting in, installing uh, low carbon energy solutions in homes, insulation, etc. So I think hopefully you can see the diversity of the group. We've got offshore operations, we've got call centres, we've got engineers going out into customers' homes, and we also span both North America and Europe. And I think if you start to think about the nature of the people involved in that, we've got a very diverse population, which is a challenge for actually getting that well-being message across. Uh, the brands... Um, Many of you will know the British gas brand in, in the UK. Centrica Energy is the group that actually does the, uh, the sourcing and the generation of, of energy. Uh, Centrica Storage, as it says, is the storage uh, operation which has to be uh, separate from the energy operation. And over in North America, direct energy is effectively a, a sort of microcosm of Centrica. It has all the upstream sourcing, the generation, uh, and delivery into customers' homes. So quite a, a big organisation and 37,000 staff. So when I'm talking about the, the scale of the organisation and well-being in particular, it's 37,000 people uh, working across 55 locations, 11 countries in those different activities uh, which we're, we're talking about. Um, and I've got a quote there from, from Sam Laidlaw which actually covers the health safety and environment piece. But again, I think key to that, coming back to the last phrase there, fundamental to the success of our, success of our business. And Sam is a huge supporter of health, safety, environment, and is right behind the wellbeing programme as well. 
and that makes a big difference. So I mentioned the HSE strategy, and this uh, slide is just on one slide, just very simple portrayal of what we're trying to do. And any of you who have worked in the sort of safety field um, will realise this isn't rocket science, to be honest. This is moving from a sort of compliant culture where people do as they're told, it's sort of safety as green hat, you must do this, you must follow this procedure, to an interdependent culture, which is actually about caring for each other, about, you know, we're actually all in this together, and, oh, just watch out what, what you're doing. And I think if we actually get that culture, we have a much, small, a much safer operation, and I think the engaged workforce is key to actually uh, delivering that. So this strategy, and there's, there's a lot more behind this, believe me, um, is built around two, two principal uh, fundamentals. One is the management system, which is the structure, and I call it the head, and the other is the leadership behaviours. And this I call the hearts, and to me, this is the 80% of it. Um, and I think if you start to look at some of these leadership behaviours, um, and again, it's not rocket science, you'll see different uh, words, but basically coming to the same thing. Um, these behaviours are trying to capture what we're doing in, uh, in the culture change. Um, now, OK, they're words, but just it's worth, I think, just mentioning where they came from, because the first two came directly from the output of a, a half-day session we had with the executive, where they actually were considering where they wanted to take health, safety and environment in Centrica, and what did they feel were the key behaviours that they wanted to drive. So these are sort of words directly from the executive's uh, mouth or mouths. Um, visible leadership and learning and sharing. And I think when we reflect later on what we're trying to do in the wellbeing programmes, those are completely sort of harmonious with that agenda. The other two, coaching, facilitating and communication involvement, came much more from a sort of bottom-up approach. We ran a series of workshops to try and sort of articulate the, the strategy, get the detail of what we wanted to do. And they came really from a bottom-up uh, approach. But again, I think you can see that, you know, things like commu communication and involvement, i.e. engagement, um, is key to the well-being uh, agenda. So hopefully you can see how generating this cultural change for our strategy for HSE, it's totally synergistic with what we need to do in well-being. So um, just thinking about the business case, and we all, I know, try to look for the right metrics for, for the business case and what are the pound notes and dollar signs that will actually convince uh, the boardroom. Um, and I'm just drawing on this model from, from Tim Anstis, who's actually supported us in some of our uh, well-flourishing people days, which I'll, I'll return to. Um, and basically, again, thinking about the leadership behaviours. So those ones I just showed you, showed you um, there's compelling research that says that leadership behaviours impact the sort of the, the climate, the culture of the organisation, trust, the respect, and the sort of positive negative feeling ratio. Not only the effective sort of positive management behaviours, but also the things that actually people do, which actually undermine that culture. And if that affects the culture, it actually then goes into uh, this sort of hopefully positive feedback loop cooperation, well-being and productivity. So if I just sort of reflect, right, what's the business case for the well-being agenda? And I just put this slide up again and think about the power of uh, actually impacting the culture of that 37,000 staff. I mean, to me, that is just, um, you know, it, it states its case automatically. Um, if a small productivity increase on the 37,000 staff uh, actually has huge, huge uh, potential benefits. And I think that message is, is pretty well understood by our executive and by our board. And certainly, um, whilst we still search and we try to find uh, good metrics, and I'll, I'll show you, um, or I'll give you the, uh, the link to our website where we've just published our corporate responsibility report, um, we're starting to put metrics in but I'm getting great support from the, the board and the executive for just driving the, the well-being programme forward. And what we're doing, the strategy specifically on well-being, really 
uh, has three sort of main uh, components to it. Be well, get well, stay well. Uh, and I'm sure you'll see again the synergy with the, the BITC work model, for example. But what we're trying to do with these is drive that leading uh, health and well-being performance. The foundation that I mentioned there is the foundation of the hs &E strategy, so the management system, uh, the cultural, the, the behaviours, etc. Um, and we're trying to move from that compliant state to a leading and then advanced state in health and well-being as well. Uh, and we have a roadmap again to try and signpost that where businesses can do a self-assessment against where they are on well-being specifically to measure their, measure their progress. Uh, inevitably, we're trying to continue to embed the health management strategy um, because we do have health risks, and, and I'll point to those in a moment. Strengthen our business assurance. So I mentioned management system, and we need to, this is the head part, we need to do that in, in health and well-being as well. And we've now introduced a health management system to, uh, to sort of provide that assurance. And visible health and well-being performance at board level. And I was actually at the board last week, and in the section talking about well-being, again, wholehearted support and you know, a lot of uh, very positive body language that we need to uh, progress that, which is great to get that support uh, from the board. So this is the, the tool I was uh, going to show you, and I'm not expecting you to see the detail of this at the back. I'm going to do a bit of zooming in. But I think it's really quite an engaging, engaging tool uh, that... Um, Tricia O'Neill, our group head of health, together with Delta 7, have developed. And, um, okay, it's a picture. But if we actually start to look at what this picture does for us, and starting to get the indications of how uh, it's being used, it's, a, I think, a very, very powerful tool uh, to actually engage staff. And what it is, it's the inevitable roadmap, as you can see from left to right. Um, and taking us on the journey from that non-compliant state, if you like, compliant, up to uh, the uh, leading uh, state we want to get to. And obviously there's a lot of nice pictures. I'll just zoom into the, the start of the journey. Um, and this is really way back at the, the non-compliant state um, where we've actually, you know, have an unsatisfactory level of accidents and certainly if I go back to 2008, we were in that state. We had over 600 lost time injuries a year. Um, you know, very poor performance. Um, and we've come a long, long way since then. But we're also flagging up the cost of, of absenteeism, and the cost, cost of presenteeism, um, you know, sick, sickness absence, a sort of tick box approach. And really, that's not where we wanted to be. And so we've moved away from there. And this is really where we're... Um, uh, aspiring to get to. So the leading culture where it's in the DNA of the organisation that you know people are actually, this comes back to the caring for each other, looking out for each other, caring for each other, giving people advice, leading by example um, and overall increase in our well-being. But key, a key component on that journey is this whole question of choices. Because you know, life's about choices, but work's about choices, managers have choices, staff have choices. And what we're doing with this tool, it's not just saying this is what we're trying to do, here's a picture, but actually develop a dialogue with groups. And I think it's quite, uh, it's only recently been uh, uh, produced this, but we, I think we've already got over 400 people who've seen this and worked with it. And uh, they can take a specific issue, uh, you know, say uh, work life balance or stress management, uh, and then start to think about this issue and then sort of broaden their minds thinking where they've come from, where do they want to get to, and what choices are they going to make. So it's almost encouraging to make some of those decisions and those commitments to actually move forward as teams. So I think a really very, very powerful, uh, powerful tool. Um, and obviously, by all means, come and uh, talk to me or, or Tricia O'Neill um, afterwards about that. Um, so, it's been a busy time. Um, I would certainly not uh, claim to have got there yet. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that's uh, been done. Uh, three new health standards, so we need to have that structure. This is, again, coming back to the head. Um, the identification of the at-risk populations. And two, I think, 
we have known about for, for some time, the musculoskeletal and mental health uh, uh, communities where, or, or components where we've actually got active interventions, back care workshops, stress management programmes, but also trying to get into the sort of proactive uh, management of, of resilience rather than just the reactive stress management. But increasingly, uh, emerging items like obesity, late age working, obesity a real, a real issue, uh, you know, as, as for example, engineers working in homes need to be agile, getting into corners, think about, you know, the effects there. Offshore, believe it or not, this has actually impacted the numbers of staff allowed on offshore platforms because they have to have lifeboat capacity to get staff off and lifeboats now are not able to carry as many people. So, you know, it's, it's actually having quite an impact on, uh, on business. And um, these things have to be, to be thought through. Late age working, again, an emerging issue, or probably a present issue, both in our downstream populations in UK and North America, but also in, in upstream, um, which I think is an industry issue. And we're doing some work with Loughborough University to, to look at that. Um, secured multi-level leadership. Um, I think it's very important not just we need the support at the top, which I believe we have, but also engage with uh, the businesses at all levels throughout the organisation because you need to get that critical mass uh, and groundswell of opinion across the across the organisation. Um, the growing relationship with BITC, we've uh, recently joined, I guess, last year. Um, but again, I think growing that relationship, uh, participating in the um, in the reporting guidelines, for example, and other areas. I think that it adds huge value to what we're trying to do, but also gives an opportunity for learning. Celebrating success, must do that, and we do that uh, through things like entering uh, awards, the Occupational Health Awards winner there, um, and developing the brands. Brands are with a, a plural, um, the, the well-being, my well-being uh, brand there, um, this was the, the brand we used for our Well Flourishing People events, which we've run throughout last year and running for further events this year. And it's not just a, a sort of conference which, you know, is done and then forgotten about. Um, we had one in Edinburgh back in October and um, probably a similar sized room, standing room only, uh, a whole range of guest speakers. Louise actually came to speak. Um, fantastic event and they still talk about it now. And that has really generated a lot of engagement in that, that call centre community in Edinburgh. And uh, another brand here, this is uh, in British Gas. Obviously, British Gas has its own compelling brand, and it's important that the well-being message is branded again to fit with that, that, uh, that culture. And so their programme, Smile, it's all consistent with what we're trying to do. But uh, that's their programme. And some results um, from the British Gas uh, business. Um, employee engagement, 66%, high performance range uh, as uh, sort of recognised by benchmarks. Great places to work, again moving that, uh, that score up, particularly on well-being and work-life balance. The reduction in, in attrition and reduction in, in absence. So yeah, it's difficult to establish cause and effect, but I can only think that this is having a positive uh, impact and supportive impact on those um, on those scores, and a couple of there of, of qualitative statements, which I think again are very compelling. So the fit with the BITC model, and I'm going to show you're going to see this uh, uh, circle a lot today. But I think just reflecting on it, there is a huge fit. Um, you know, I've mentioned the strategy: be well, get well, stay well. Certainly, you can see the components of that in the, the sort of inner inner circles. The branding and the engagement uh, through the brands, the pictures, um, get involved is our volunteering programme and really taking off and a whole range of volunteering events um, around the communities. And Validium is our, our new employer assistance provider, but we've seen in a short space of time a huge increase in, in um, take up, in line manager referral, you know, actually an active awareness of the importance of the EAP. So all those components, I think, they're all there in the BITC model, so I think there is great, great synergy. Future plans, um, really consolidating the basics. We can't forget those communications, the management system, uh, and interventions. We mustn't forget those interventions. You know, we've got to uh, maintain that. Um, 
but I think very important, touching health and well-being in the employee life cycle, right from the start. So when people come in, they've got to immediately feel that this is important to the organisation. It's got to then see and be enduring right the way through uh, in the employee life cycle. Um, developing people capability, and again, um, two things here that we're doing, well-being advocates, which is sort of like the, the informal role, the, the ambassadors within businesses to try and take that message uh, forward. But I think specifically as well, we're running a, uh, a formal accredited health and well-being course, um, which is accredited to QCF, qualification credit framework, NVQ to, to me anyway, um, but basically giving people a chance to get a formal qualification in well-being, both at a, a line manager point of view, so for at the sort of lower level, just getting an awareness, but also to the practitioner level. And I think that's generating quite a bit of, of interest and discussion uh, when we've talked to other, other organisations. Supporting the wider agenda, and so, you know, operations like organisations like BITC, the relationship there, I think, are very powerful, and we have an opportunity to both learn and share there. Um, influencing public health policy, so engaging with, with those groups. Um, and Loughborough University, I mentioned the late age research. I'll finish on the, on the guidelines. Um, that's our fairly lengthy link, but to be honest, it's very easy to find on the, uh, on the website. We have recently published our corporate responsibility report. I think our comms team have done a great job in actually uh, producing a, a very sort of lively uh, report um, and quite a big section on employee health, which I'd recommend you uh, have a look at. So I think that's me complete in time for coffee. Okay. Thanks.